These are a few ones that we didn't get to. We're trying to do our best to be short and concise as possible without restricting any potential benefits to, we can try to bring out. So you mentioned hierarchy of desire, where a person at the stage of, quote, desire to know no longer found lower desires important. Does that mean that concession is given where their marriage is no longer a priority and their path towards knowing overrides everything obliged below. Where is the balance? For example, husbands who continuously engage in khuruj or pursuits of knowledge, and many women have this concern. Um, my point in mentioning that is that it's in the hierarchy of, de of desires, it, it, it's, just, it, it's a reference to the strength of the desire. Uh, and, and that it doesn't at all mean, though, that one neglects their other obligations. And this is why Imam Malik was asked about sacred knowledge, and he said that sacred knowledge is a good thing, but you have to look at your state and look what is the duties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has imposed upon you. So you cannot seek sacred knowledge to the extent that you're neglecting other duties. This is why it's recommended for people to postpone marriage if they're going to study full time and so that they can take care of the basic level of studies before they get involved in a marriage because your body has a right upon you, your wife has a right upon you, your children have a right upon you, your family has a right upon you and so that you have to put everything in its proper place so that this is where that Imam Muzadi is mentioning the hierarchy of desire and I didn't mean to say by that when they, they, they uh, don't find the other desires important that it means that you can neglect people that have a right, no that this is where that even though you have a desire for something, you have to also put everything in its proper place. And so that there, ultimately it's about the balance. And that just as it's a good thing for men to go on khurush, it's a good thing for women to support their husband going on khurush. But also that men need to be balanced if they're going to go on khurush. And it's eventually about finding that, that you know, middle way. Of where you're, you're, you're not neglecting the khuruj entirely, but at the same time you're not neglecting your family. It's about the balance. And so that, that um, uh, uh, you know, and, and the opposite, you know, that, that women who enjoy seeking sacred knowledge such that uh, they're neglecting their children or their husband and so forth, is also on, on both sides for, for men and uh, women. What portion of time should you devote to surrounding yourself with people of deen, e.g. Imam Afros and people you feel uh, need it, e.g. father, brother, best friend? Again, it's all about balance. A lot of these questions that we're going to get back to the same meaning of balance is, is that you have to be around good people. It's very important. And that you also at the same time have to help bring other people uh, into uh, a positive environment. But one of the golden principles is is that you don't help other people to the extent that you're going to harm yourself. And so that different people have different levels of resistance. Some people can intermix a lot and not be harmed. Other people have to do very little. And the Sharia, the sacred law, delineates the bare minimum. That in terms of being around other people, as long as you're at least sending salams to people, then you're not considered to have forsaken them. And uh, you don't have to be everyone's best friend. Some people are, are just like, you know, from the army and others are from the navy. They just don't ever get along. And um, how can that? And some people are sheep-like and other people are wolf-like. And they're just never going to get along. And they don't have to, as long as they at least give each other their basic rights as Muslims. And so again, it's just balance between... Uh, the foundation that you're around people of the deen and then giving everyone else you know, the, their rights and a lot of the question comes up all the time about family members you know, what if your family's not practicing and you know, I can honestly say it's probably easier for me as a convert 
being around my family than it is for, for many of you around if you have family members that are not practicing. You know, I remember when, you know, you know I've heard stories of you know, people that might not have been wearing hijab and they start wearing hijab and their family members that like, gather up against them. And, you know, and, you know, why are you doing this? You know, this is dangerous. We live in a post-9-11 world. And they're going to look at us. And, um, you know, I, I know people in my wife's family that when their when her grandmother came to the United States that her children almost forced her to take off her hijab because they were too embarrassed to be with her in public. I would be that and this type of stuff. So, again, it's, it's back to that balance.